Ever wondered how Google, Amazon, or Microsoft build software that handles billions of users without crashing? It's not magic, it's system design. Hi, I'm Maddie, a senior software engineer who's worked at these tech giants and other companies throughout my career. And today, I'm talking through 10 essential system design concepts that separate good mid-level engineers from great senior ones. If you want to build truly scalable tech and accelerate your career, keep on watching. Let's dive in. So first, what even is system design? System design is about planning and organizing the architecture of a software system. Think of it like building a house. System design involves creating detailed architectural blueprints. It's about meticulously planning how all of the different components of your software system, like your databases, servers, APIs, and microservices, will interact, communicate, and work together. Let's kick things off with some foundational theory that guides all distributed systems, CAP theorem. You've probably heard of CAP. CAP stands for Consistency, Availability, and Partition Tolerance. It states that in a distributed system, you can only choose two out of three when a network partition occurs. Consistency means that that all nodes will return the correct and most up-to-date response for a request. Availability means every request gets a response. And partition tolerance means that the system continues to operate even if there are communication failures between nodes. Since network partitions are almost inevitable in real-world distributed systems, you're usually choosing between consistency and availability when creating your system. While CAP theorem is great, it's an oversimplification of things. So to address that, there's actually a related theorem, PASELC or however you pronounce it. <laughs> Pasalk expands on CAP by stating, if there's a partition, you must choose between availability or consistency, like CAP. Otherwise, when there is no partition, you must choose between latency or consistency. The concept of trade-offs in system design is super important because it reminds us that even when everything is healthy, we're constantly making trade-offs between how fast we can get the data and how consistent the data is across our system. Understanding these inherent trade-offs is critical for designing any complex distributed system. As a concrete example, imagine an online store's inventory system with two data centers. If the network between them fails, that store must choose either stop taking orders to ensure consistent stock levels everywhere, thus sacrificing availability for consistency and partition tolerance, or continue taking orders, potentially leading to different stock counts in each data center and needing reconciliation later, sacrificing consistency for availability and partition tolerance, thus showing that you cannot both have perfect consistency and continuous availability when a partition occurs. Now let's talk about how we handle growth within systems, scaling. Imagine you have a single server running your application. It's happily chugging along, handling a few requests, but what happens when suddenly your app goes viral and you have thousands, even millions of users hitting your server all of a sudden. It's not going to be able to handle all of those requests. This is where scaling comes in. There are two types of scaling, vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. First off, we have vertical scaling or scaling up. This is quite straightforward and involves making your existing server more powerful. For example, adding more RAM, upgrading the CPU, and getting a faster hard drive. However, even if vertical scaling is great for quick fixes, it's still limited by hardware ceilings. And if that single single super powered server goes down, your entire app is offline. That is a single point of failure. This brings us to the more robust approach, horizontal scaling or scaling out. Instead of making one server bigger, we add more servers. So if one server is overloaded, you can spin up another and another and so on and so forth. This is powerful because in theory, you can scale up almost to infinity. You don't even need super expensive machines, just a bunch of regular servers working together. Also, we get redundancy and fault tolerance. If one server goes down, it's fine because there's no single point of failure. So with all of these horizontally scaled servers, how do we make sure that requests are distributed evenly? That's where load balancers come in. Think of a load balancer like a traffic conductor for your application. When a particular request comes in, the load balancer directs it to an available server that is the least busy or best equipped. This prevents any single server from getting overloaded and keeps your system responsive. There are many techniques that load balancers can use, but here are a few of the most popular. Round Robin. Round Robin is one of the simplest load balancing techniques. It's sends each incoming request to the next server in the line, looping back to the first one once it reaches the end. It works well when all servers have similar capabilities, but it doesn't account for various workloads or server performance. Now let's talk about least connections. In the least connections method, requests are sent to the server handling the fewest active connections. This is really useful for applications with long-lived sessions like video streaming or database queries. Next, we have weighted round robin. Weighted round robin is a smarter version of regular round robin. Each server is assigned a weight based on its capacity, so 
more powerful server gets more requests. This balances the load more effectively in environments with mixed hardware or instance types. And finally, we have IP hashing. IP hashing uses the client's IP address to determine which server should handle the request. This ensures that a user always connects to the same server, which is really helpful for maintaining session consistency. It's commonly used in scenarios where sticky sessions are needed. Closely related to load balancers, especially in a microservices world, are API gateways. While a load balancer primarily routes network traffic, an API gateway acts as a single entry point for all client requests. It can handle routing requests to the appropriate microservice, but also provide cross-cutting concerns like authentication, authorization, rate limiting, and even transformation of requests or responses. Next, let's talk about improving speed and reducing load by using caching. Imagine that you're constantly fetching the same piece of data from a database that's slow and very resource intensive. Caching creates a temporary super fast storage area for frequently accessed data. So for example, let's say you're stalking your ex on Instagram. If you check their page continuously, Instagram will cache and only update the cache when there's actually new data that your ex posts. When a request comes in, we first check the cache. If the data is there, we serve it directly from the cache, which is incredibly fast. If not, then we go to the primary data center like a database, retrieve the data, and then store it in the cache for future requests. Caching dramatically reduces the load on your primary data sources and significantly improves resource times for your users. We see caching everywhere, from CDNs or content delivery networks, for static files like images and videos, to in-memory caches for frequently queried database results. This is a go-to strategy for performance optimization. Now let's talk about the center of almost every application, databases. They're where we store the data. Different database types have their own pros and cons. You're probably familiar with SQL databases, also known as relational databases, like MySQL. They store data in structured tables with rows and columns, enforcing strict schemas. They're excellent for complex queries and ensuring strong data consistency through ACID properties. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, four key properties that ensure reliable transactions in databases. Atomicity means that a transaction either fully completes or doesn't happen at all. Consistency, which is a bit different from the consistency in CAP theorem here, ensures that the database always stays in a valid state before and after a transaction. Isolation prevents transactions from interfering with each other, and durability guarantees that once a transaction is committed, it stays saved even if the system crashes. Then we have NoSQL databases, which are more flexible and often better suited for handling large volumes of unstructured or semi-structured data. Examples include MongoDB, which is document-oriented, Cassandra, which has column families, and Redis, which deals with key value store. They often prioritize availability and horizontal scalability over strict consistency or rigid schemas. Once you have a database, especially in a high traffic system, you can't just have one copy of your data. That's where replication comes in. Replication is the process of maintaining multiple copies of your data across different servers or locations. One common pattern is leader follower replication. In this pattern, all write operations go to a single leader node, which then asynchronously replicates those changes to multiple follower nodes. Reads, however, can be served by either the leader or any of the followers. This helps distribute the read load and provides redundancy. If the leader fails, a follower is then promoted to become the new leader. There's also leader-leader replication, where every replica can handle both reads and writes. This can be more complex to manage due to potential data inconsistencies and conflict resolution, but it offers even higher availability and can be great for geographically distributed systems where you want users in different regions to write to their local replica. As your data grows, even with replication, a single database or even a single replicated set might become a bottleneck. That's when we introduce sharding, also known as partitioning. Sharding is about breaking up a large database into smaller, more manageable pieces called shards or partitions and distributed them across different servers. Think of it like dividing a giant book into smaller volumes, each on its own shelf. Here are some common sharding techniques. In horizontal sharding or range-based sharding, rows of a table are split across multiple databases based on a range. For example, let's say user ID is 1 to 1,000 in one shard, uh, 1,000 to 1 to 2,000 in another shard. It's easy to implement, but uneven data distribution can lead to hot shards if most traffic targets one range. On the other hand, in hash-based sharding, a hash function is applied to a key like the user ID, and the result determines which shard holds the data. This helps to distribute data more evenly, but makes range queries harder and sharding more complex. And finally, directory-based sharding involves a lookup service that keeps track of where each piece of data lies. This gives you full flexibility in assigning data to shards, but adds overhead and a single point of failure unless replicated. And next up, let's talk about message queues. Message queues are super useful for decoupling different parts of your application and handling asynchronous operations. 
A message queue acts like a buffer. When your system generates data, it publishes it to the message queue. Other parts of your app known as consumers can then pick up those messages from the queue and process them at their own pace. This has a couple of huge benefits. It prevents your system from getting overloaded. It decouples your components, meaning that changes in one part don't necessarily break another. And it provides durability uh, because messages are persistent in the queue until they're processed. Think of sending emails, processing image uploads, or running analytics jobs in the background. Message queues are perfect for those asynchronous batch-like scenarios. Okay, so we've talked a lot about servers and data storage, but how do different parts of your system or even different systems talk to each other? That's where APIs or application programming interfaces come in. An API is a set of rules and protocols for how software components interact. It defines the method and data formats that other applications can use to request services from your system. Think of it like a menu at a restaurant. It tells you what you can order and how to order it. This concept is especially relevant with microservice architecture. Instead of one giant monolith application, microservices break down an application into smaller independent services that communicate with each other primarily via APIs. Each service focuses on a specific business capability capability can be developed and deployed independently and can even use different technologies. This offers tremendous flexibility, scalability, and resilience, but it does add operational complexity and requires careful design of those API contracts. And last but not least, you've built this amazing scalable system, but how do you know if it's actually working correctly? How do you know if there's any user-facing issues? This is where monitoring and alerting become absolutely critical. Monitoring involves collecting metrics and logs from every part of your system, CPU usage, memory, network traffic, error rates, database queries, latency, and so much more. You want to have a clear picture of your system's health and performance at all times. Tools like Prometheus, Grafana, and ElkStack are commonly used here. And alerting is taking that monitoring data and setting up notifications. If an important metric crosses a certain threshold, let's say error rate strike or database latency skyrockets, you want to be immediately notified, whether that's through an email, a Slack message, or even a page to your phone in the middle of the night. Proactive monitoring and alerting allows you to identify and fix issues before they become major outages, keeping your users happy and your system reliable. And there you have it, 10 essential system design concepts that every senior software engineer should know. From theoretical foundations to practical implementation strategies and operational insights, these concepts are the building blocks of modern, resilient, and high-performing apps. Hope this video was helpful, and if you enjoyed it, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more tech stuff. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.